Welcome to In the Know and Black Girl Podcast presents Enter the Chat, a special video series that looks inside our very own and very private girl group chat. On this episode, we have Dr. Jess, and we're talking about grief. Hi, welcome, Dr. Jess. Pleasure to have you back. Thanks for having me, (laughs) y'all. I love it. So for everyone who hasn't um, made themselves familiar with you just yet, can you let the audience know exactly your background, what you do, and um, the complications? Yes, sure. Um, So um, I'm Jessica Clemens. I am a board certified psychiatrist Um, through my work on social media, like normalizing conversations about mental health and and interviewing people to sort of help with that. I'm known as Dr. Jess. Um, I work full time and take care of patients every single day, uh, but I love to be able to talk about mental health um, in the public space to get people comfortable with seeing a therapist and all that stuff. So yeah, that's me. Grief is just a huge, uh, it's a huge conversation and there's so many ways we can start discussing it, but probably the best way to start is to define, you know, what, what is grief? Yeah. So, so grief is, it's a normal reaction to, to loss. Um, and so it's, it's thought to have five different stages. And I think we all think about grief when, you know, there's a death, right? We think about, holding space for someone to grieve um, through that major, major loss. But as I said before, it can occur with really any loss um, that a person has. And the five stages are not necessarily in a specific order, but a person can experience um, depression. Um, They can also experience bargaining, uh, denial, anger, and then finally acceptance. And I know I threw in finally, um, but that's the ultimate goal um, when a person is going through the grieving process to get to a place of acceptance. But you can float through any of those stages at any point um, during the process. And did you say bargaining was one of them? Yes, it is. Um, So I would think of it like um, when we are bargaining, especially through the grieving process, you're almost looking for um, some way to like give a token or some sort of uh, step that you can make in order to get what you've lost back, right? And it could look like if we've lost a loved one, for example, you know, dreaming and feeling like they're there and sort of running through examples in your mind of like something you wish you could have done differently. And had you done that differently, they'd be here. And so that's sort of that piece where you are trying to come up with a way to sort of bargain to get that missing piece back. I was just going to say, I feel like the bargaining phase is one of the longest phases of grief. Is that actually True, because that I know for me personally, losing my father, it took me a very long time to remove the back and forth of things that I could have done differently to possibly keep him keep him here. Is that in loss in general, not just necessarily with death, but is that typically the case? You know, I think, again, I think it's each person is unique in, in how they would go through the stages. But I think you're on to something and that a person could spend a lot of time there because you know, you're, you're looking in your mind for, for the answer. And, you know, and especially if losing a parent, it's just, you know, you're going through memories, you're going through events that may have led to their passing. And again, you're just kind of thinking about it over and over and looking for a way that maybe something else could have been done. Or if I would have tried this, then this wouldn't have happened. So I would agree with you that I think it, it, it certainly could be one of the stages that a person spends a, a longer period of time in. Um, but then also the depression stage, I think, is is right there with it, right? The sadness, the loss of hope, um, the guilt that may come with that um, loss as well. I wanted to ask you about, because we're there's like we were talking about before, there are so many different types of grief. And in 2020 alone, we've grieved normalcy, um, the day-to-day of our regular lives before coronavirus changed everything. People have lost people, but also just lost themselves or how they know themselves. And so I wanted to ask you, like, in, in, as far as moving on from this year, what are the steps of, what are some initial steps for people who are really struggling with the grief of the things and experiences they've lost? What are some initial steps to take there as well? Just because I can only imagine the trauma that we'll all have to deal with after experiencing a year like this. Ooh, that is a word, Gia. Um, I, especially the trauma, I mean, this year has been quite a year, even with all the good things that some people are experiencing. It's been a tough, tough year. Um, 
I love that question. I think, you know, it, it starts with, I think, a, a person realizing that uh, grief is a reaction that can occur with any loss. And so I think sometimes we have this tendency, especially Black women, to sort of compare our experiences to others. And then it's somehow, you know, we, we want to say, well, my situation isn't as bad. So, you know, this can't possibly be a feeling that I should have. Um, so I, I would say it starts with recognizing that if you are experiencing any loss, job loss, loss of a friendship, loss of a relationship, loss of being able to go out and see people, you know, in person, that is a, a loss. And so your psyche doesn't know the difference between death and between losing a job. It knows that it, there is a loss occurring. So I think that's the first step. Um, recognize that you probably are in a grieving state. And so once you are recognize that, because you're listening to this and you heard it, you recognize it, I think the next step is to begin to process it. And processing can look like just holding space to talk about it. Um, you know, I'll tell my patients that, Gia, I'll say, listen, you missed, you know, the t chance to spend Thanksgiving, for example, with a, a loved one or the, uh, the other holidays that are coming. Hold space for that and don't just kind of let it pass, like talk about it. Talk about what that experience is like. What do you miss? What are those things that you wish you could have gotten? What are those things that you won't get? Um, and that that processing, that space will allow you to sort of begin to go through those stages at your own pace. So definitely the first step is to recognize that grief is existing in pretty much everyone's life and then hold space to process it by just talking about your feelings and, and the experiences that come up um, because of those losses. I have a question as far as you being a psychotherapist in this particular time, dealing with so much grief, and you know, you've also just gone through life changes. How are you maintaining both? Because no one saw this pandemic coming, you know, and I'm sure the amount of traumas that have hit your office have doubled since we've been in it. So how like how does a black woman psychotherapist like yourself? manage during this time? I know that's a little off topic from grief, but. <laughs> no, I appreciate um, the check-in for sure. I, it's, it's been difficult. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of people are coming in um, experiencing depression. They're experiencing anxiety. They are looking for me to help them process it through therapy, but also with medication. Um, and, it's hard because I, I'm holding space for them, but also recognizing that I can't tell you when the pandemic will end and when you will be able to get a job in the industry that maybe is completely shut down. You know, I have people who are in, in music and in hospitality and they have no sense of what the future may look like. So um, that's hard. And it's hard uh, for me as the, the therapist to, to kind of know what to do with that space. But I just kind of go back to holding the space and also being honest about what I feel and that this is hard for me as well and not using the time to process what I'm going through, but just to normalize it. Like we're all going through this, but it's okay for you to use this time to talk about what's going on with you. And then I shut it down. I don't, I don't like, you know, I have set hours. I, I don't visit it on the weekend. I try to do that to make sure that I don't get my cup, um, you know, sort of lose that, that sort of, uh, uh, ability to be able to hold space for people. So yeah. AKA boundaries. <laughs> In the stages with grief, can you, can you, um, go through a stage and then pass it, but then go back to it? Or once you're past that stage, you've completed it. And there's, there is no more of that feeling once you're going through the process. So how do, how do the stages work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can definitely cycle between any of those stages um, at any time. Sometimes I like to think about when especially explaining it to someone is that uh, grief comes in waves. And so, you know, you might be feeling fine. You know, you thought that like, OK, I've, I've made peace with this. I'm at a place where I understand and I, I, you know, I'm not feeling so down. I'm not angry about it. And then it hits you and you might find yourself in tears or you might find yourself feeling overwhelmed and confused again. Um, and that's OK. And that is normal. And so I don't want to make this like it, it deserves to, to be treated by a psychiatrist or a therapist. But um, if a person is starting to go through this a lot and, and they need some help, it is absolutely OK to also get grief counseling again, to have that space to process it and to also have healthy ways to cope. Um, but you can absolutely cycle between any of those stages at any time. Um, and they're not in a set order. 
I wanted to know if the grieving process looks differently for someone who is experiencing loss within themselves. Um, you know, I think there are people who have decided to let go. We've been given the gift of, ref of reflection, right, through sitting at home and things like that. And I think some people have decided to let go of some traumas. But when you let go of some traumas, you know that you've, like, you've att attached yourself to the trauma and you've identified with that trauma so much that it's become a part of you. And when you decide to let that go, you now have to figure out who you are without that trauma, you know, without that piece. I always wanted to know, you know, once you lose a piece of yourself or feel like you lose a piece of yourself, and that is grieving, you know, something that you once had, um, does that process look differently at all? I, I love that question. I mean, I think, I, I don't think there's a right answer here. So I'm going to, you know, do my best to sort of talk about the way I, I would think about it. I, I think um, you're absolutely right. It is a, it is a form of loss so that, you know, a person would grieve that, but I, I think it, it can look different because I think in that example, um, a person is also working to either rediscover themselves or to, to learn more about who they are. So I think the, the work is a bit different, right? And so, um, you know, if you're grieving the loss of a loved one, you're going through the stages, but you know, you can't get them back, right? You have to learn how to have a new relationship with this loved one in their, you know, um, life after. But in this case, I think you can spend the time going through the stages, like grieving, accepting that this is gone, but also like learning who you are now without that piece, without that trauma being a part of your identity, right? If it's a person who grew up in a household where they had an alcoholic parent and they only know how to have a relationship with others who are also sort of not emotionally available or, you know, abusive. Once they start to, to learn that about themselves, accept it and then leave it and try to grieve, you know, grieve it. Now they have to figure out who they are without that part of themselves. So I think it's a little different because you're going to be working on identifying what is making you, you now. Does that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. Do you think there's a possibility to find joy in the grieving process? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, oh, good. I it ain't is. never seen it. So help me. <laughs> I mean, I just think about how it's a process and there's different steps to it. Is there any way to find joy in those pocketed moments of depression? Uh, you know, like, and I'm very much a optimist, so... <laughs> I love that. I mean, I, I, I use the term um, and it was given to me by like a, um, a mentor of interpreting up. And so I love that he described when we are like with our patients and they're depressed when we see that piece of them, that's like seeking help. And that is doing the work. We sort of tried to like identify that and speak to that and give that space to like, look at this part of you. So I would agree that my hope is that people, when they're grieving, that they are looking at this as almost like being a phoenix going through, the, like coming out of the fire. Like, I am going to come out of this with joy. I'm going to come out of this with peace. I'm going to come out of this, right? And so I would say, yes, I would hope that people could find joy. But I also don't want to diminish if a person isn't because it is a, it is a process. Um, and it's a long process too. I it think is. with grieving, sometimes you know, when my grandmother passed, I was like, "When is this going to? When I'm going to stop crying? When am I going to stop crying about you know certain memories or you know just looking at a picture or having somebody talk about her still makes me tear up." And I'm like, "When is the grieving process going to end?" But you know, through learning, you know people talking to me it does come in waves like you said dr jess um but i don't think a lot of people know that i think once they are done with the process of grieving they feel like it should go away you know you shouldn't feel those things anymore you shouldn't cry anymore um yeah and that that's that's far from the truth i'm sure how how would you advise um so i was on the campaign trail and um Kamala Harris had mentioned that her mother passed away from cancer and she was approached by doctors um, to seek grief counseling for anticipatory death, like grieving somebody knowing that the inevitable is, is bound to happen any day now, as opposed to like, we all know one day for each of us, it won't be. 
But when you know for sure, like in, in a set amount of time, it's about to be over for somebody that you love. How do you, what advice would you give to somebody who is grieving as someone's still around, processing that they will no longer be, but still having them, like still having them until that moment happens? Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, that anticipatory grief is certainly a thing. It can be helpful to have like a support group and it can look like something, you know, very specific, like looking up uh, NAMI.org, N-A-M-I.org. They have a lot of group um, uh, resources throughout the country, but like looking up a specific like survivors of um, uh, support like a relative of a survivor of cancer or a relative of um, someone who passed from cancer or living with cancer, just looking up specific um, support groups. But it also can look like making sure you lean into the people like your, your, your loved ones that you can be open with about how you feel and what you're going through. Um, because it, it is a part of like the process of, of loss, especially when you know it, it it's coming um, or it, it could come. So, you know, my advice would be to really start looking into support groups. And if you, you can't find one leaning into your, your village or your community to, to talk about that um, and taking breaks. I think people who are caring for their loved ones too, when they're sick um, need to, to really take care of themselves too. So you have to make sure that you are giving yourself space to, to just sort of survive it, um, you know, and, and make sure you're working on your self-care during that process. My question is similar to Rebecca's, but I am more so wanting to get a, not necessarily answer, but just get your feedback on grieving um, the ideas of someone, the potential of someone, especially your, your, you know, your mentors or your parental units. How best, I know me personally going through therapy, what I am going through is just um, identifying the what I thought were existing and realizing what is. So how do you grieve in that process? How do you let go and shed still be grateful and give thanks, but still put self first. I mean, that's hard to do. I think especially, um, again, coming from like black families, you know, there's a, and I think we, we touched on this a bit too, in terms of like that relationship we have with our, our parents, our elders and the respect. And we, you know, tend to sort of give into that dynamic. I think it, it really starts with learning a healthy way to put yourself first. And, and I, you know, as you all said before, putting those healthy boundaries up, being able to um, set limits, right? Like if you're having a conversation and it doesn't feel like it's, it's you know, healthy anymore, just sort of finding a way to, to shut it down. Or if you know that this conversation you're going to have with the loved one isn't healthy, you know, sort of calling and saying, hey, I only have like 10 minutes, but I wanted to check in about this and being real specific about how you're going to engage with them. Um, but then I think we we all have to come to terms with that our, our parents, our loved ones, for the most part, you know, have done and tried to do the best they could. Um, and so we have to kind of give them space for that. And also knowing that the time that they came up, there was the, wasn't this conversation about mental health and and sort of the ability to talk things through. They just had to deal with their issues the way that they could could at that time. So having space for that and almost having a little grace that you give them. How do you speak about grief with children when they know death is happening, but they don't have the understanding or the language to really like articulate or have a conversation about it? How do you console or have a conversation with children? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in my work, I don't work a lot directly with, with children, but I do, you know, work with parents. Um, and a lot of times what I advise them is to create a safe space and, and to try to use whatever it is that that child identifies that you recognize that they feel comfortable in. So, you know, it might not need to be like a formal sit down and face each other. Usually that doesn't work. It might be sitting beside them while they, you know, are watching a television show and you guys are watching it together, not something that they're so into that they won't pay attention, but something that you both can, can sort of be doing together and talking about how you feel. I think the first step that people have to learn and, and it's really important to do is the more that we share our internal world with others, it, it invites them to as well. And it also models for our, our children, especially like what is healthy and what it looks like. So start by, you know, finding that space that you can sit alongside your child and start talking. I mean, right now in the pandemic, it, you know, you can talk about what it's like to, to, 
to not be able to go, you know, into the office or to not be able to see friends and family to sort of start that conversation off and invite them to talk about how they feel. And if you need help with what those feelings are, you can look up things like the feelings will, which can give you exactly like the word for what you're describing, but, but helping them to kind of talk it through, um, and then just normalizing what they feel, validating what, normalizing what they say and validating what they feel. Um, and they, you may not name it as grief, especially if they're really young, they won't know what that is, but you're just giving them space to process it um, and know that they're not alone in what they're going through. For people who can't speak or don't know how to talk or communicate their feelings, what does that person do? Because I, I know personally a lot of people in my life who struggle with even just one, identifying the feeling and two, communicating it efficiently and respectfully. So how does someone who doesn't know how to necessarily do that, do that? Whew, that is, a, I think, you know, I'm stumped on this one, uh, to be honest. I mean, but <laughs> I think, you know, let me think about this. So I think the, the approach it for someone who maybe they, they're hearing this and they recognize, okay, we're, we're talking about grief. This is something I could be going through. Um, I think it's important to just recognize maybe what your actions are. So, and what I mean specifically is like how you're coping. So for example, if you were someone who you didn't really drink a lot, maybe you drank a little socially, you know, but it's when you're out at a party, but now you're drinking a lot at home, you know, start trying to put two and two together. Like, hmm, why am I drinking so much now? Um, and, and perhaps one of the reasons could be that you're feeling down, depressed, anxious, and maybe the upstream experience of that is that you're grieving and, and hopefully you can start to see that. So pay attention to some of your behaviors that you can at least quantify. Am I drinking a lot? Am I not sleeping as well? If I'm smoking cigarettes, am I smoking more? If I'm smoking, you know, other stuff, what am I, what does that look like? Um, and then I think also it can be helpful if you have one person who you can be real with and they're real with you ask them, you know, how do you think I'm doing? You know, I heard this conversation and I think I might be grieving, but I don't have the words for it. Like, what do you think? And, and start that conversation. And it's not always going to need to be neat. You might not have the language for it, but just start trying to talk. And then it might be helpful to seek help because that is what you can do in your, in, in a therapy, right? Your therapist can actually help you learn those words, um, help to identify the emotion that you're experiencing so that you can have the language. I do think that people can get to a place where they can start to articulate what they're feeling, um, at least you know from a place of when where, where they couldn't before. I do have a question right behind that um, with showing up for someone who is grieving, um, because a lot of people don't know how to be there for that person and how to do that in a healthy way. Because you know you don't want to give too much space, but you want to give them space. You want to give them grace, but you know, you don't know where to stand. And it's, of course, people are different um, and you don't want to be overbearing. But what's a healthy way to show that you want to help or you want to be there? You know, I don't I don't know what that looks like. I really am bad at that. No, I think that's an important question because we don't want to also overextend ourselves and then end up being, you know, a, a sort of vessel for a person to just kind of dump all their stuff on or in, in that example. So I think it, it looks like number one, going into a situation, if you're going to like reach out in support of, of, of a friend who's grieving, going into it with a plan, right? So, so you're going to go into it, like knowing how long you're going to be in conversation with this person. You're going to go into it when you're in a space and not feeling, uh, and not feeling like overwhelmed or sort of weighed down, or like this is a call you're making at the end of a very stressful day. You won't do it then. You'll do it when you're in a place with like, okay, I, I have the bandwidth to be able to sort of hold space and hear, hear them out. You're also going into it knowing that your job is not to have the answer, that your job in that case is to be supportive, to listen, um, and listening to just sort of understand. You're not going to be like, oh, this is what you should do, or this happened to me, and I, you know, this is how I got through it. You're just going to give them space. Um, and then if it gets to a point you know, during that conversation where it could go on and on, you know, it might be sort of being um, recurring about the messaging that it sounds like you could benefit from talking to someone. That's the way I speak. But, you know, it might be that, you know, I think now's the time to really get some more help. Um, I've had and that might be where you share and say, I had, you know, a really good experience with the therapist and maybe we can start looking them up. But I wanted to check on you and sort of giving that 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 closure with the conversation that you're, you want them to get help. Um, 
is I think a good way to also, you know, get out of there, especially if it's something you think is going to be going on and on and on. So with that said, I do think it is really important to just tell the listeners and people who are watching, you know, platforms and places they can search for therapists, um, as well as, you know, the insurance process, what that looks like for some people, if they have it, is it expensive? You know, that's a question that's always asked, especially in the black community. So just provide some resources for us here. Absolutely. So I know most people have heard about Therapy for Black Girls. Um, I think that's a dot .org. Um, it's a resource that I certainly have told people to go to to find a therapist. I've also learned about inclusivetherapist.com, and that's also um, a, a resource, especially for anyone who feels like they're in the margins of identity. What I mean by that is like, you know, they're not sort of in the heteronormative standard. So um, that's a great resource to find a therapist that also kind of identifies in different ways as well. Um, NAMI.org is a great place for group therapy. And I, I recommend that, especially if you're like, I don't know if therapy, individual therapy, like one-on-one -on -one sitting across from someone is for me. Groups can be a great way to start. You can learn a lot. You can share. You can sort of you know, not speak if you don't want to. So that's a great resource as well. Now, in terms of cost, I always think about it like this. Um, you know, if you can, can really prioritize and take care of your mental health, that's going to be probably one of the most important um, things that you can do. And so it's well worth the money. I think we do spend a lot of money taking care of how we look um, on the outside, which is important as well. But this will do the work of taking care of what's happening on the inside. So it's worth the money. Um, a lot of therapists also provide what's called a sliding scale. So you can ask for that, especially if right now you, you don't have insurance or, you know, you're underinsured. So that means you don't have like the best insurance to kind of see everyone. Um, so ask about that. Ask about a sliding scale. Um, and oftentimes that can range from like $50 a session, um, 100 even, but that, you know, you can space it out over the month. Uh, but I definitely would encourage people to do um, that in terms of any questions around cost. Great. Awesome. We love you, Dr. Jess. We thank you so much you. for being thank here. You, thank you so much. We'll definitely do a part three soon, honey. We're going to have you back because we got to hear about how motherhood is for yes. you. Congratulations. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, y'all. Well, I've been Gia Peppers. Who's next? I'm Scotty Beam. I'm Beth Francois. <laughs> I'm Sephira M. And I'm Alicia P. So you can make sure to see more episodes of our show. Enter the chat on InTheKnow.com. Thank you for tuning in.